We're going to begin today with those upcoming federal by-elections. We have reporters standing by in Montreal and in Winnipeg, where on September 16th, voters will be heading to the polls. But let's begin in Montreal, where today, NDP leader Jagmeet Singh was out campaigning in the Liberal stronghold of La Salle et Mard, Verdun. In this by-election, people have a choice. Justin Trudeau, who's let you down and abandoned you, or Craig Sauvé and the NDP, we're going to fight to lower the cost of your living. That's the choice in this election. The CBC's Quibina Oduro is outside one of the advanced polling stations in the riding, and he joins me now. So, Quibina, uh, Jagmi Singh, the NDP candidate, are out today. What did you see and hear from them? So when Jagmeet Singh arrived on site, he shook hands with the volunteers and then he spoke to reporters alongside Craig Sove and they were really talking about how they believe that they are the right party to represent this writing in the House of Commons. Now they also left uh, the press conference by going to uh, house to house to knock on doors to appeal to voters as the advanced voting has started. Now Craig Sove is known in this area. He's been a municipal councillor for many, many years. And he says that because he knows the area and he knows what people want, he's the best person to lead this riding. After my 11 years of experience in the municipal world, you know, I learn about governance, I've learned about how to get things done. Uh, and I'm absolutely shocked about the inaction we've seen from the Liberal government on questions like housing. Uh, we're living it as in, in this city, you know. There are lands that are waiting for social housing development and the financing's not there. They haven't put the money forward. So we got to get this done. So the NDP is trying to get that breakthrough in this area, but standing in their way are the Liberals and the Bloc Québécois. This is a Liberal stronghold. It was the former Cabinet Minister David Lametti's riding, and now the Liberals are desperately hoping to keep this riding theirs. And our colleague Rafi Bujikanian spoke to the Liberal and Bloc Québécois candidates earlier last week. The last couple of years have been very challenging. So again, people have the right to have their opinions about RPM, and I respect that as well, but we've had some very good energizing conversations about what I can do once I'm elected to make a difference in the riding. This election is not about independence. This election is about Justin Trudeau's record, and I think that people want to send a strong message, and people who want to send a strong message to Ottawa that too long they have been taken for granted by the people in Ottawa, well, I want to be their voice. And I think that uh, voting for the Bloc is a good way to protest. So all the candidates are trying to make headway. They are trying mm. to appeal to voters. And here at this polling station behind me, People have been flocking in and now dozens of people all wanting to get in early and cast their ballots ahead of the official by-election voting day on September 16th. Okay, so Quibina, let's talk about those voters because you say the NDP are trying to have a breakthrough there, but they've only got one seat in Quebec right now. David Lametti held this seat. Paul Martin has held versions of this seat. What are voters saying to you about their intentions on the 16th and, and today? Well, David... Many people are telling me about the issues that matter to them and the top three that come up constantly is the cost of living, the environment and the housing crisis. And the housing crisis has been the one that I can tell you almost everyone that I've spoke to has mentioned. People are saying that the cost of living over here is way too expensive. For example, I've talked to so many couples that they say that they have downsized by moving into smaller places just so they can afford to live in the places that they are living in now. So they are hoping that their vote will pressure the government and the MP to push for better housing uh, situations in this area. I spoke to one man who says that he's living off of his pension but his pension is just going away because the cost of living is just way too high. And some people have even expressed that the situation going on in the Middle East is also mm. having implications on who they will vote for. And a lot of people, David, that I want to mention about is that 
there are 91 candidates on these ballots and people yeah. are saying that it's very overwhelming <laughs> when you go in there to vote. They're saying that even though they know who they're voting for, it still takes them a while to find out who they're voting for. For some of the people who came here hoping to figure it out while they were in uh, the ballot area, they say that that was very overwhelming because they had to look at so many names just to find out who they want to vote right. for. So a lot of people are on different areas when it comes to voting, but people are just hoping that whoever represents them in this riding will affect change and will help with the housing crisis. Okay, Quibi, now I would get you to go through all 91 candidates, but I know it's a bit of a protest on by the longest ballot committee, but so thanks so much for that. That's the CBC's Quibina Oduro in, in Montreal. We're going to turn now uh, to Winnipeg, where there's the other by-election. Advanced polling has also opened in the federal by-election in Elmwood, Transcona, a riding where the NDP and the Conservatives are battling out. And that's the CBC's Bartley Kivas. He's in Winnipeg. He joins me now. Uh, Bartley, I think you've only got uh, five people on the ballot out there, but, but tell me about this race. Tell me about this riding. Yeah, this is a historic NDP stronghold. It's an interesting riding in that the NDP and the Conservatives have been going head-to-head -head here for the past 24 years. Um, the NDP have won all but one of the elections held here since this riding was created and its predecessor, Winnipeg Transcona, in 1988. The Conservatives only won it once in 2011 when Stephen Harper had that large majority. And the Tories are trying to win it back. They are appealing to uh, what they the believe, the perceived notion that this riding is a, a very labor-dominated riding. Mm. And the average, if you look at StatsCan uh, numbers here, we, there are more people in manufacturing and work operate heavy machinery here than other Winnipeg ridings, but it's not really that much. But the, the Conservatives have nominated a candidate, um, they're running a candidate, Colin Reynolds, who is a union member, and they're trying to get that union appeal to, to run against the NDP here, and the NDP right. have Leela Dance. What the NDP don't have is somebody named Blakey running. <laughs> Daniel Blakey, who resigned in March, and his father, the late Bill Blakey, they were representing this riding for every NDP term except for one by uh, Jim Malloway, who's now a Winnipeg MLA and was before that as well. So this is an interesting race where the uh, Conservatives and the NDP are at it, and the margin of victory in 2021 was 9,000 votes for the NDP, but again, no Blakey this time. No yeah, Blakey. and that, 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 that's a key thing, right? Even New Democrats say it's a New Democrat seat, but it's really a Blakey seat. Um, he's working for Wab Canoe now. So, so let's talk about the party strategy so far on the ground. Canoe making a presence, Heather Stephenson making a presence, apparently in some of the literature. What's the strategy been like there? So the Conservatives are really trying to connect the NDP here to the Liberals. I mean, mm. that two-year confidence and supply deal that just ended, for weeks there have been uh, campaign signs put up by the Colin Reynolds Conservative campaign with pictures of Singh and pictures of Trudeau and describing Singh as sellout Singh and trying to suggest that a vote for the NDP is a vote for the Liberals. And that didn't end on Wednesday. No. Um, Reynolds has challenged Dance to, to say if she is elected, whether she would uh, vote in a non-confidence motion Motion. She said, look, I'll take everything issue by issue. She shot back saying, hey, Colin Reynolds, how come you're not doing interviews? How come you're not going to candidates' debates? This is something conservative candidates uh, often, if not always, do. So it's, it's a fascinating thing. Uh, we, we, I, one of my colleagues spoke to uh, political scientist Royce Coop, and he doesn't often see one party trying to win an election against another party by tying them to a third. No, but this is an unusual time. Bartley Kivas, and thank you so much to CBC's Bartley Kivas in Winnipeg, where they've got an interesting race going on. Okay, we're going to get a look at the lay of the land now, a bigger picture as we get closer to voting day in those two by-elections. And here with me in the studio is Dan Arnold. He, was the chief, he is the chief strategy officer with Polara, but he was previously part of Justin Trudeau's senior staff as the director of research and advertising, which meant you looked at a lot of polling, Dan. <laughs> Thanks every for joining. Every hour of every day, I'm every looking hour. at spreadsheets. That's all I do. <laughs> well, when, when you think about those spreadsheets and you listen to what we just heard from La Salle Mar Verdun and, and, and Elmwood Transcona. What is your sense of where those by-elections are, are potentially going to go? I mean, the, the fun thing about by-elections is it's just so hard to predict, actually, right? Like in a general election, you've got more reliable polling. You can extrapolate down to a local level pretty mm. well and see projections. But in a by-election, turnout's going to be lower. You know, turnout's usually about half as much in a by-election as a general election. I mean, it was high in St. Paul's, but even then, majority of people didn't vote. Right. Uh, so then it becomes more about motivation, becomes more about ground game, less about just support, which is what the polls are usually picking up. Uh, and then you've got the local dynamics. In a, you know, in a general election, you're voting for the prime minister. I know uh, constitutionally you're not. I know, I know. That's how voters... Twitter's going to... The pedantics are going nuts. That. I know, I know, I know. That's how voters are thinking, right? Yep. And in a, in a by-election, like, the fate of the government is not 
in their hands, usually. Maybe this one's a bit more important for, for other reasons, but um, you know, they're looking at local factors. So I think it's, I think it's hard to predict in that case. Um, you know, I think for that reason, I wouldn't be that surprised. I mean, the NDP could lose a seat they hold and win a seat they don't hold, and it wouldn't shock anyone, I don't think, at the end of the day, because of that uncertainty. Well, let's think about the implications of those possible outcomes. Let's start with Les Salimard. After losing a seat in downtown Toronto, can the Liberals really afford to lose one on the island of Montreal? I mean, a cabinet minister seat and another cabinet minister seat. I mean, what does it mean for Justin Trudeau if they don't hold on? Yeah, I mean, like, in downtown Toronto, island of Montreal. I mean, it's the base, that's right? as liberal as it gets. Um, but I think, like, in reality, by-elections shouldn't be that important at the end of the day because of those things we just talked about. There's a mm -hmm. lot of weird factors at play, and the polls are probably telling us a lot more than by-elections will. But in politics, if people say something is important enough, it kind of becomes important. Uh, I kind of think of it like the Olympics in that respect. Like, uh, you know, this this summer, we all got excited by hammer throw, and we found out Canada's <laughs> the best in the world at hammer throw because everyone said, this year, this is the competition that matters. There was a hammer throw competition last year. I don't know who won, and it, no one cared about it, right? But because it's the Olympics, it becomes important. And if everyone says this by-election is really important, it becomes self-fulfilling in a way because all the media is writing about it afterwards. Caucus is probably a little bit more vocal and critical of the PM if the Liberals lose. So it, it can become a bit of a spiral after the fact. But, you know, the calls are coming from inside the House for, you know, a, a different direction for the government, different messaging. Like you say, you looked at spreadsheets every hour of every day. When, I don't know if you've ever looked at spreadsheets like the one that are being produced now based on the polling. I mean, when you look at the data, what, 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 what is the path for the Liberals now? What is the opportunities for growth in any of these uh, scenarios? Yeah, like, big picture. I think, you know, the problem that they're facing more than anything else right now, there's a lot of problems they're facing and a lot of causes to get to this position. But mm -hmm. the biggest one, I think, is just that people feel crappy about their lives, uh, high inflation, housing. We just heard the reporting. Yep. That's what voters are saying, right? And you know, that's not something they're going to be able to solve themselves in a couple of, certainly not by the, these by-elections, certainly not even by uh, you know, the end of this uh, year. Um, but the problem is when people are feeling like that and they're feeling like the government's not helping them, the government starts to seem more out of touch, right? So I think what the Liberals need to do is, is show voters that they are helping them, not helping them in five years with plans to build a million houses mm -hmm. in 2030. They need to give them immediate help, which is what voters are asking for right now. Um, they need to help all voters, not just the most vulnerable, because I think the middle class is feeling like sometimes the government turns an eye to them to help the people who are really at the bottom, but the middle class are the ones that are buried by uh, interest rates. Well, they've been trying to do that on a policy basis so that they don't juice demand and, and, and overheat the economy and, and make the inflation problem worse. Well, we may be at a point where they can reconsider that, perhaps. And I think they probably have a little more leeway to do that. And, and look, it doesn't have to be new policies. Something could just be, you know, it's, uh, sometimes it's just a matter of reminding voters what you have done. And, you know, people forget very quickly about things governments have done. And if you can remind them that you have been helping them over the years, um, you know, that makes you feel less out of touch. Right. So they've got their caucus retreat next week in Nanaimo. Uh, the development we learned today, uh, first reported by the Toronto Star, is that uh, Mark Kearney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada, is going to be briefing the caucus on productivity and economic recovery. I mean, what do they need? This is the, the caucus retreat they all wanted after St. Paul's. They're getting it just before La Salle Mart. What do they need to do at the caucus retreat? Um, and and what, what do you think they want to come out of it? Yeah, I think the caucus retreat a lot of it. There will be, I'm sure, a, a festivus in September, an airing of the grievances, <laughs> yeah. and, and people will get all that out. And there's probably going to have to be some some calming of nerves too. It's been a bit of a turbulent week for the Liberals, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. caucus will be jittery, and a lot of it will be convincing them that there is a plan, uh, a plan to get back out of this hole that they're in and to and to win the next election. But I think after that first kind of calming of the nerves, it you know, becomes about what's the path forward. And I, I, you know, I used to present at caucus retreats all the time. And, you know, I'd get up there and the presentations I'd usually give would be, this is what we should be talking about. This is the language we should be using. This is how we should talk about the other guys. And I don't think it'll be that different this time around. I imagine a lot of it will be, how do we talk about Polyev? What do we tell voters about what we've done? And just try to get everybody on the same page. Well, how do they talk about Pierre Polyev? Because there has been a lot of frustration and the amount of liberals I've had on the phone with me saying, why are we not taking the fight to this guy? Why haven't we paid for ads to attack the guy and try to define the guy? I mean, they, they feel like they've kind of just ceded the battlefield and they're not punching back. Yeah, and I, I think... The, from my perspective, I think what they need to do is just be more consistent in the way they are dealing with Paul Yev. I mean, they, at one point it was kind of he was the MAGA candidate. Yeah. At one point it was he doesn't care. And I think you pick a lane, you go with it. I, I think realistically the Liberals don't have $10 million to roll out a big mm -hmm. campaign that's going to blanket uh, the country for the next year. But uh, certainly they can 
take the opportunity of a cabinet or caucus retreat like this to say that this is how we're going to talk about the guy. Let's all do this in a consistent way for the next four months and let's see if it works and whether or not it's, he's risky or he's dangerous or he doesn't mm -hmm. care or he's Trump light. There's a lot of different directions I'm sure they could take that in, but I think pick one and get everybody going out in the same direction uh, for the next bit. They need to pick a strategy and be consistent with it while at the same time there are internal calls for change. You, you've worked in the Prime Minister's office, you've worked on the campaigns, Jeremy Broadhurst leading as a national campaign director because he's been at this for a long, long time. Uh, I mean, do you anticipate big changes coming in, in terms of a shakeup in there? Do you think they just need to kind of find a new strategy as opposed to changing personnel or maybe even the boss? Uh, I mean, well, there's going to be a new campaign director, so I guess yep. that's by definition that's change that's going to be coming there. Um, I think there's different ways to show change at the end of the day, and I mean the underlying problem uh, probably doesn't get resolved just by shaking up some staff or cabinet ministers. We did a poll last year, and only 40% of Canadians could name a cabinet minister. Yeah. So you know who the minister of heritage is at the end of the day probably isn't going to change too many votes. But um, you know, change from a policy perspective, from a direction, from a way that you're communicating, yeah, that'd be welcome for sure. Yeah, and when they shuffled the big, big cabinet shuffle last year, opened up St. Paul's and LaSalle and, and, and look at yes, where that comes. Unintended up. consequences. Yeah, unintended yeah. consequences. So you say, look, it's been a big uh, turbulent wink, right? Like they're going into caucus. They've lost their campaign director. They've also lost their governance partner in, in the NDP. Elmwood Transcona, the stakes are higher there for them. You heard Bartley talking about it. How they don't have a Blakey, so that means it, it could change. With what Jagmeet Singh did this week, you know, you talk about language and what you're talking about, he's trying to frame this as a binary choice in the next election between the New Democrats and the Conservatives. Does he have to win both of these? He's got to hold Elmwood Transcona if there's going to be a follow-through on that argument. If he loses a seat to the Conservatives like that, that that's a problem, is it not? Yeah, I mean, you do a big thing like the... Uh the figurative ripping up of the uh, agreement, and then there's going to be a, a test point within two weeks afterwards, yeah. right, with these two by-elections. So you are kind of raising the stakes in that respect, because if they, they do this big gesture and then lose both by-elections, um, the spin is going to be like, look, this obviously didn't work, this was a mistake, and the party's adrift right now. So they have, they have raised the stakes, and uh, yeah, if they don't pull it out in Elma Transco, and I do think the... Um, as we talked about, the Wab canoe effect will help them a bit yeah. there. I remember in 2015, we were doing, you know, I was doing the polling for the Liberals, and in Manitoba, um, you know, Greg Selinger was just a drag on the NDP fortunes there, and they barely won the riding that election. Then in 2021, Brian Pallister was the drag on the Conservatives, and they won by a big margin. Um, you know, we're at a time now where Wab canoe is still uh, he's adored on the, he's yeah. a 66% yeah. approval rating. Uh, so I think, I think that will help them and I'll give them some headwinds, but even with, if they can't win with those headwinds, that even makes it look even worse, right? So I think, yeah, the stakes are high for them too. Okay, uh, Dan, uh, it's good to have you in here. It's Dan Arnold, former uh, director of research and strategy, was it with the, with the Liberals and now with, uh, with, with Polara. Um, all right.